Just keep. Welcome to the MIT AI and Quants online education series. We're here with another fantastic lecture from Gregory Peltz, a, dis a director at Scotiabank. The late, great Peter Carr described Gregory to me personally as a brilliant mind. And in 20 years of knowing Peter, he was not someone who easily called someone else brilliant. So I'm so excited to learn from Gregory today. And today we're gonna to be learning about solvable models, symmetries and magic, a new family of uh, SPV, SPL, uh, the sol uh, of solvable models. Um, so very excited, Gregory, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, for the warm introduction. I hope I, uh, you don't you didn't give me too much credit and I would be able to amuse the audience. Uh, so let me uh, share my slides. The presentation is uh, fairly technical. So, um, so it would be hard to do it without some kind of... So can, can you see my slides now? Yes, I can see your slides. Okay, uh, okay, great. Uh, this is a work which I did with uh, my friend Peter, uh, sorry, with my friend Michael Konikov. Uh, we presented it as Kuhn uh, Mind International, and uh, it's dedicated to our friend uh, Peter Carr, which actually, he is actually a great mind, and he was also a brilliant mind, and he was a, a very good friend and very kind and nice person. Yes, uh, and uh, it's a uh, somehow continuation of some work of discussion we did with him. So it's a, it's not just dedication. It's like I think if he would be still with us, uh, it probably would be our joint work. But unfortunately, he is not. What uh, what we plan to do here uh, seems fairly kind of mathematical and technical, but we are target very. We have a very specific, very practical goals. So uh, often, so when pricing models, are, uh, they it seems that they formulated in fairly simple and not so kind of mathematically, mathematically complex way. However, in the process of solving this model, pricing this model, calibration of this model, they happens to be actually very difficult and not transparent. And uh, the uh, difficulty actually is becoming so great, especially for approaches like market model that uh, at the end, uh, the results are very not transparent and uh, you compromise here and there, your Monte Carlo doesn't converge, uh, you don't expect what results can be. And even though basically the model is very, seems very simple, uh, very for human, uh, they're not simple for computation. And what we're trying to do, we're trying to do something opposite to that. We don't mind that model is hard to understand, but the model uh, have to be easy to work out with the current uh, computer power, with the, current, uh, with the current tools, and can be like very transparent. Everything should be easy to understand and you don't have to, uh, to compromise in accuracy. And that's what we call like solvable. What's mean solvable uh, for uh, most of the model, even if you want to compute like a simple thing, you have to like price European option, find distribution and something like that. Uh, you have to solve uh, some partial differential equation, very often uh, multidimensional. You have to run Monte Carlo. And when you're running Monte Carlo, you, uh, when you price like have any pricing problem, it's usually have very specific event days. Uh, days of when you, uh, like register the price of the underlying, the day when you deliver payoff. There are not so many days like that. But uh, in order to uh, simulate the process, beside that day, you have to insert many small steps just because you have don't have close home a solution for terminal distribution. So we would like to have the model where we have for any kind of subset of observation day, we want to have all the distribution in the closed form. Other models like that already, actually very few. And when people come up with this model, they usually limit uh, themselves to a very sim simplistic, very constrained set of models. 
And uh, it's uh, like Levy processes, actually even Levy processes are not quite close for, we all know you have to do Fourier transformation, which is uh, actually can be pretty expensive. Uh, there is a, a joint Gaussian distribution and various affine model, which indeed may mm -hmm. have like a closed form, almost like basically we don't go too far from Gaussian. Uh, and uh, for all the like models we know, for stochastic wall model, for almost any model we know, we need to actually do daily like short step simulation. And above all, if we want to do American Monte Carlo, it uh, becomes like really, uh, really very complex and very computationally very heavy. And I will claim that with regression and all, there is a lot of cheating going on. So people are actually pretty far from getting the correct uh, American price with most of the technique. Not because it's theoretically impossible, but just because you don't have enough of uh, regression variables, regression function, and so on. Uh, so, uh, so we would basically want to solve this problem. We would like to have the model with closed form, which we can uh, have simulation with no additional steps. Uh, and uh, we would like, we would use it for American Monte Carlo. Also, we can use it for various closed form likelihood uh, for time series estimation, if we would like it. So basically it's a model like this can be very helpful for doing uh, empirical research as well. Uh, the next slide is not 100% related to the rest of the presentation. I just wanted to demonstrate how closed form distribution can be used for uh, in the, for pricing options with early exercise. What is the main problem when you price an option with early exercise? You have to uh, estimate uh, your prices at some future point and some future state. And what happens is that you can't start your simulation from the future point in the future state because then you have to have like independent set of paths for every future point. And it's, uh, it's, it's it would just, the number of simulation you have to do would just explode. So it's like, uh, if you have small enough times, like large enough number for an exercise, it's like become completely unfeasible. So what people normally do, they, they run some, set of one set of paths from today's day and based on the set of paths you have to estimate uh you have to estimate um the value of that uh, of the future price uh which is like extremely difficult because you kind of a compromise roughly speaking uh you 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 try to figure out what you have to do should you exercise or not what can you do you can look at someone in a similar situation if you have uh, someone, and it should be just one person, it should be like many person which has similar situation, then you can kind, kind of average out and make a decision. But what happens is there is not enough people like you, right? And there are not enough people with similar situation and you don't know how to, how you can, with what way, what weight you have to assign to the person who is in slightly different situation. So to get like, and there is no really normally answer uh, what you should do to get a fair estimate. You can have some estimate, but uh, you know that in the end, if you run like infinite number of paths, it would converge, but you're pretty far from infinite, right? So uh, so here we, we propose a technique how to compute actual fair estimate based on the uh, set of paths which generated from the current state, how we can estimate the future price. And for that, I will suggest one trick, uh, this trick, can be easily used for the model with closed form distribution, but cannot be used for the model. It, it formally can, but uh, physically, uh, practically cannot be used for distribution without closed form. So let's say we want to estimate uh, a value of some payoff uh, at the some time uh, T1 and at the state uh, Z hat. I use Z variable to describe step, uh, state. It shouldn't be just one number. It can be like multivariable state. It doesn't matter. So, uh, so at the, let's say we have closed form distribution that at the time T1 and at the time of the payoff is delivered at the time T2, let's say we have some closed form distribution which I denote by uh, the uh, letter mu. And then if we have payoff P, then to, to find the present value, we just have to integrate the distribution. So that's, uh, that's kind of a 
commonly known formula, basically just it's a formula for expectation for continuous distribution. Now we're making a little trick. We can take this number and multiply it by one. And how we can represent one? One we can represent as an integral of this part distribution to the time t1 of the state z1 integrated over z1, right? So let's just do that. So we can represent uh, expectation like that, right? So uh, when we simulate the paths, we actually use different distribution. We use like uh, joint distribution. So if it's Markovian process, it would be product of T0, Z0, T1, Z1, and uh, to uh, a spot distribution and forward distribution of T2, Z2, integrated over DZ1 and DZ2. Now let's think about a standard trick, which we use, for instance, when we want to apply important sampling. If we generate uh, our pass with one distribution, but now the real distribution, which we have to compute expectation with, is different. So what can we do? We can actually use a previous distribution, but weights weighted by the ratio of two, uh, two uh, partial density function. So the density function which we need is this one, and the density function which we generate is this one. We, so we have to just divide one uh, over the, another. And the first multiplier cancel out. So we just have a ratio of two conditional distribution. One based on the state, uh, which is this, this pass from the state which passes generate, uh, we need. So from Z hat divided over uh, distribution from the point at which the pass is generated. So the conclusion basically is that we can take uh, a given set of paths and we can fair estimate for the future values. And that's a great tool for uh, pricing uh, with uh, um, with uh, optional exercise. And it's not really, it's pretty useless if we don't have closed form distribution, but if you have closed form distribution, it can come handy. Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, I have to kind of go back and introduce some formal, uh, some formal mathematical uh, methodology and definition, uh, which are uh, not really uh, too complex. Uh, excuse me, I just have to take a short pause because of my dog. Yeah, so, sorry, sorry for interruption. Uh, so. Uh, so let's it's it's what it's conformal transformation. So conformal transformation essential tool how we build this uh, closed form models. So uh, conformal symmetry in two dimension actually very simple. It's just conformal transformation. And uh, if we're looking at the conformal symmetry, the compactify complex plane, uh, they are it's well known fact they they related to so called fractional linear transformation. Fractional linear transformation. Uh, it, uh, they are fractional linear transformation. Basically, it's a, uh, it's a ratio of two linear function and the coefficients are related by two by two matrices. And you can demonstrate that they actually make a group. Uh, it's related to two dimensional projected space. It's a group of uh, two dimensional two by two matrices. And uh, we need to have like, uh, if we have a time homogeneous model that we need to uh, work with a conformal evolution. Conformal evolution is a, family of uh, uh, conformal transformation, or like in this case, they could represent by two by two matrices, we just kind of form a group representation. So uh, this evolution of sum of T should be equal to the product of two evolutions. And it can be easily constructed with uh, through the exponential of two by two matrices. Uh, it's not, uh, for us, it's also would be important to define a process region. So, um, and the process region uh, we will choose, which will be either circles or half planes and all this type of shapes in the conformal plane, they can be also associated with two by two matrices, but of a different type uh, that called Hermitian matrices. So uh, basically it's a, it's a matrices which uh, uh, a joint matrix, which come uh, like conformal edge, uh, how to say complex a joint. So basically, it's a combination of um, uh, transpose and complex conjugation produce the same matrix. It's called a, a Hermitian matrices. 
it can be easier uh, to show that this Hermitian matrices, they can correspond to some functions on Z and the area where this function positive actually form like circle or half lane. And if we want to see how this area transform with time, uh, it's, it's basically the common rule. You have to transform this Hermitian matrices with the Hermitian matrices transformation rules in uh, in like two-dimensional uh, two linear algebra. And uh, that's what, uh, uh, that, and they would transform exactly like that uh, with respect to the conformal transformations. So full, like, uh, I'm sorry for introducing all this kind of mathematical math, and which if you knew that before, it probably would be very simple for you. If not, uh, you can uh, like find it anywhere in any common mathematical literature. So what, why do uh, we need to do all that? So we need to uh, define, uh, start with uh, what we call conformal diffusion. What is the conformal diffusion uh, in our definition? It's actually just nothing else but diffusion in two dimension. The, this two dimension we just assign, like look at them as a complex number. So for that, we should uh, define what is a standard two dimensional winner process. And it's just a combination of two uncorrelated winner processes. And each of these winner process has a, a, a step. Yeah, it's just two uncorrelated winner processes, that's all. And uh, it's a, it's it kind of isotropic because it's a, it would have the same volatility in all, in all the dimension of complex plane. And that's what we need. Uh, it, uh, it can have various scale, which we call volatility. This volatility for now, it can be any process can be subordinated to Z, so it will be function of Z like a local world, or it can be independent. It, it just uh, uh, doesn't doesn't really matter for now. So uh, that's not all. We don't want to allow it to move everywhere in the complex plane. We actually want to constrain ourselves. And as I mentioned before, uh, as an area where, the, where the, we allow the process to exist would be this round area or half plane. So we would go within this plane, with this type of areas. Uh, half planes, of course, very rarely. Normally it would be like circles. So you can say a uh, 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 straight line is just a circle which goes through infinity, roughly speaking. Uh, and so uh, what we need, we need this area to expand. Why we need this area to expand? Because if we reach the boundary, what we can do, we can say, okay, at this time we kill volatility, we make volatility equal to zero. But uh, it doesn't mean we'll stay in the region uh, because we can kind of, uh, happens to be outside of the region, but because region is keep expanding that when we, the boundary next moment will not be the boundary anymore. So that's why the boundary is not absorbing in this case, just because it's moving moving away. There is, there is a different uh, representation of the same model, you can say, or the area stays the same, but you have certain drift, and this drift would uh, take you away from the boundary. But in our language, it's easier to think about no drift situation, but moving boundary. So we're taking this uh, parameterization right now. So it's easier to work with that. And, and for the model to be time homogeneous, uh, the, this um, ex expanded set of uh, round region, they have to uh, they um, they have to relate to each other with some conformal evolution, and there is certain constraint on the generator of conformal evolution that makes set of the circle uh, one um, expanding. Um, um, uh, it's very I I don't I wouldn't list it here, but it's a fairly simple constraint. Okay, now just want to show you this beautiful picture of Salvador Dali. Um, uh, I hope it's not copyrighted. Uh, uh, the reason I'm showing you this picture because, first of all, it's uh, in a way emphasize conformal symmetry because conformal symmetry is kind of you can think a stretch thing without uh, changing angles. So it's a kind of very conformal, and that's why I like it. And also, it shows clocks, and uh, time is the next thing we're going to play with. So, uh, 
what is I, I don't mean to about? interrupt you Gregory I, I don't mean to interrupt you but you know the amazing uh, point about Dali is that he had a, such a traditional uh, artistic education and that he was originally a, a, a charcoal uh, landscape sketcher I would happen to have studied Dali intensely and so I think uh, your uh, example there was really uh, fantastic uh, really wonderful example yeah uh, thank you uh, one of the uh, one of the kind of funny things which Dali had to uh, say, I remember, uh, was a kind of joke, of course, he was saying that. Some people say that I'm crazy. Uh, I'm not crazy. Uh, people who buy my pictures are. And then, <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, I applied to myself in this case. Uh, but I, I don't really think I'm crazy. But it, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is looks crazy, but I'm... Uh, but actually, uh, as I said, it's uh, pretty practical and can be used for to solving many financial uh, pricing problems. So what crazy thing we're going to do next? What we're going to do next is we start playing with time. We, uh, and uh, uh, I don't know if you, and you read Harry Potter, I find it pretty amazing at some point. And uh, one of the things, like what they do, uh, they were travel 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 so when they were running out of time so what they do is they allow themselves to uh, have time while in like in the outside world uh, no time has passed they can have like uh, enough time for themselves to solve a lot of problems uh, uh, it's also was in a uh, movie with Andriana Chilintano bluff uh, what the, so they show how he operates and basically you know, like people were frozen they didn't really notice that the time passing by and at this time the character of Andriana Chilintana was going around taking things from their pocket putting, putting something in their pocket or whatever so so we imagine ourselves like that okay so jokes aside what uh, what we're going to do now we're saying yes we actually uh, want to introduce jump how we introduce jump uh, we basically say that uh, the process is still diffusive, but it's not diffusive in real time. It's diffusive in some magic time or whatever, and Andriana Chilintana time. So we actually moving around everybody. We're moving around kind of continuously in our time, uh, but a color time doesn't move. Uh, oh, they they stay stay frozen. So when finally. Uh, kind of time start moving, they realize that things change and they feel, oh, okay, jump happens, right? So that's uh, that's basically like an idea. So what we should do to implement this idea, we should find some, we should say, okay, process is going on in some magic time tile and uh, physical time we define some as a not strictly monotonic process in the, in the, uh, in the uh, magic time. Uh, how we can do that? Oh, actually, there's a very simple uh, way to do that. We just say, we just assign before we assign to every uh, to every color time, we assign a region, right? So what we're going to say is that actually when we, re when we reach the age of the region, instead of killing volatility, we would say, oh, we just reached this color time, right? So basically, uh, for every time, for every color time, we just have exit point at which we exit the region, and it would be our state. And it's uh, it can be shown that if we do a trick like that, the process become jump diffusion in the color time. It's like what so called pure jump diffusion. What means pure jump diffusion? It's like uh, you diffusion you kind of merge with you jumps merge with diffusion. You don't really have diffusion, but you have jump of smaller and smaller and smaller size. So frequency of jumps in this model is infinite. But uh, if you uh, if you set how many jumps of certain size happens, then it's a finite frequency. But when you start to reducing the size of the jump, it goes to infinity. So that's called pure jump diffusion, and this type of process we introduce in this way. So what happens? We're losing one of the dimension to the counter time. So now our state, now basically our state correspond to the position on the boundary of the region, right, for each time. So it's just one variable now which is left. At this version of the model, we later on we introduce we can have more variables because one variable is not enough. 
usually to describe complexity of the of the pretty much for almost any problem. So we'll need more dimension. But in this case, let's say we stuck with with we stuck with one, and one dimension we borrow uh, to for the time, and now we restore the complex. Uh, the we have we don't have to specify uh, diffusion because uh, the scale of the magic time doesn't matter. We all we it doesn't matter how we scale magic time. We always uh, we don't observe magic time. We observe real time, so we have like control symmetry back, and this would allow us to uh, to compute distribution in closed form. So this picture just demonstrate how the process happens. So basically, starting from let's say start this our magic time process. When we reach this line first time, we say, oh, okay. Now we reach the time t zero, and at the time t zero, uh, we have that particular state is position of the circle. Then we go like our diffusion going on. Uh, we reach the time t one, and so the, we observe the state of the time t one that our position is the time t one. Then we just kind of moving around. We we go back. Nothing, uh, nothing really happening right here because. We uh, we thought uh, this second time we changed the T one nobody changed nobody saw that because for real real world there is no observation. Then when we finally move forward, reach next circle, we observe next time uh, next position D two, and so on, right? So so basically that that how uh, the process is the process is going, and. And now uh, let's compute distribution for this process. It appears to be really uh, very simple. First start in a, a, in the case where we have solution right away. It's when we exactly in the center of the circle. When we exactly in the center of the circle, exit distribution of the exit point just by symmetry is pretty obvious. It's just uniform distribution on the circle, right? Now, what happens if we are not in the center of the circle? Thanks to conformal symmetry, being in center of the circle and not in the center of the circle, I cool in problem. They can be mapped to each other with conformal transformation. And there is kind of only one conformally symmetric answer, which is presented here. I don't want to comment much about mathematical derivation. Let's say for um, it's a some game with a just conformal symmetry, projective, uh, projective complex geometry in two dimension. Uh, there is nothing really new here. Uh, just want to explain what is it here. Remind what is it? What is what here? So this is very simple kind of fractional quadratic function, uh, which is written here. So it means that distribution is actually in a closed form, and besides, it's very easily can be mapped to uh, uniform distribution just by the uh, by the same fractional linear transformation. So uh, to to make the story short. Uh, this this type of distribution extremely easy to simulate with Monte Carlo. And one thing I also would like to note if we choose our area to be flat, that this formula actually reduced to very well known uh, T student T distribution. So it's all known set of distribution. They're very simple, very easy to to generate in in various ways. Okay, so uh, so we describe you kind of some model, some process distribution of something. It's not quite clear how it can be applied. So let's uh, have some discussion about uh, how uh, how this type of model can be linked to to real world. Uh, in real world, we often have to describe uh, different assets and uh, um, with this, uh, some kind of. Uh, Correction, at least, uh, or approximation, this asset can be often related to uh, considered to be self financing. For instance, uh, if we look at the zero coupon bond, a zero coupon bond is, of course, self financing uh, product uh, and means it doesn't pay any cash flow or you don't need to make any payment to sustain it. Uh, so that's a self financing, represents a self financing strategy. If you look at the currency, 
uh, it's not kind of uh, self-financing uh, because it's supposed to pay you. You can invest it and it would pay dividends, but, I mean, interest, but you can convert it to interest rate. If you have deterministic interest rate, you can uh, you can kind of relate it to some self-financing uh, strategy. So basically, let's kind of assume that everything we're interested in in the real world is self-financing. And if it's so, we can choose any self-financing asset as a, as a numerator, and then there is a general theorem about like a measure and or arbitrage condition and under certain under under a certain condition if certain condition are met we can always say that with any asset in the full market we can assign a measure uh, like and any other value of any other asset in units of this asset would be martingale so uh, basically we're relating assets to martingales after choosing one of them as a number and. Uh, it's so uh, for us that we have to choose some martingales and martingales have to, uh, um, what are martingales in this model actually the good news is in the formal model it's very easy to formulate set of martingales uh, they just uh, associated with uh, uh, harmonic functions and harmonic functions are just can be thought of as a real part of so-called analytical holomorphic functions uh, so in this model, we can kind of really, uh, we can easily, uh, we can easily interpret it by using holomorphic function associated with different assets. Uh, so now another one thing which we want to do when we, when we want to uh, work with assets, we don't like the fact that we choose uh, a numerate dependency of our model. That people do it very often, but they find it a little uh, kind of annoying. So you decide that, let's say, dollar is your best numerator and you model everything in dollar. But what if you live in Europe and you want to model everything in euro? So uh, British pound or gold or whatever, right? Maybe it's in P. So it's kind of asymmetric, right? So to make the whole thing symmetric, we, we try to do things in a different way we want to think about every asset as some kind of a measure and then we just say that uh, if we want to obtain exchange rate between two assets it's just a ratio of two measures with so-called random nicotine derivative so we want to do it this way uh, the way we formulate model right now is not exactly like that so we, we're going to extend it the next slides but, uh, uh, before before that, let's discuss the model we currently have. So, uh, we as we said, a different assets should be associated with a uh, with a different martingale, the holomorphic function. One not so nice thing about holomorphic function: you cannot make them globally holomorphic. They have to have some singularity. The question is where we're going to put the singularities. So, uh, if the variable if the asset is not perpetual, as it's defined up to some time, uh, it's allowed to have singularity outside uh, the circle, uh, the outside the round area uh, associated with this asset, right? So uh, it doesn't, it shouldn't be defined everywhere. But uh, if you have some perpetual asset, or perpetual martingale, it's actually have to be defined everywhere. It means it have to be defined for all the, uh, in all the, uh, circles from this painted family of circles. And uh, if you model tank homogeneous, it can be shown that there is only one point which this uh, Eric as associated with uh, asymptotic infinite time doesn't contain. So to make story short, it means that there is only one point where we are allowed to have singularity for perpetual asset, uh, which is a, a kind of limited, uh, limiting and leave us uh, with very few solution but uh, that's unfortunately situation that we'll treat it by, we'll show how to treat it by modifying the model and uh, interpret it in a like different way. Uh, but in, in any case, actually, if we know the systematic point, then uh, we choose the systematic point. It's easy to associate it with an infinite point in the compactify complex plane. And then our like uh, evolution process uh, is very easy to define because it doesn't, it's not any more fractional linear, it's just linear and 
it's set of operation which combine uh, uh, scaling and rotations. Okay, so let's go over, of course, this uh, model at this point is a kind of a toy model. It's a, it's it's not completely toy, but it has limited power because we don't, we can uh, only do so many things with that. Uh, so let's leave this limitation and let's discuss how we can uh, go and solve the limitation. So one of the limitation is actually this model, uh, this framework is not numerator independent. So we have our specific like conformal diffusion and we have only one set of distribution. It means that uh, we actually choose a numera our numerator and we, all, we have to decide what, what is our ideal, uh, uh, like ideal asset in a way we can feel like it's dollar, maybe something else, but we always have to choose an ideal asset. There's one asset which better than any other asset and th the rest of the assets kind of second uh, class citizen. So it's not very democratic approach to assets. Uh, so the other like technical thing that uh, the distributions appears to depend uh, on the choice of the circle associated with the expiration time but not of the choice of the circle exp uh, exp uh, associated with the starting time. And uh, the circle area, they kind of transitive. So it means all this distribution, they can be mapped to each other and like they kind of equivalent and it reduces versatility of the model. So uh, you can come up with too many different distribution and it means you have limited power how you uh, model calibrate to uh, in uh, an actual pricing, in actual markets, in actual problems. So we we want to have more flexible way to specify distributions. And uh, the third issue that the model is one dimensional. It means that we only can model like value of an asset first of all, and we cannot even model such thing as stochastic volatility. It, to some degree, we can model stochastic volatility because. Uh, there is a multi there is multiple point in the circle apparently which correspond to the same exchange rate. Uh, it's um, uh, it's give us kind of some uh, discrete way to describe uh, volatility state, but it's far from being sufficient. And uh, finally, one of the limitation is that due to the compact nature of the of the circle, the exchange rate are bound. And it's not always a good idea. Let's say if we want to model equity, we don't want to preset the possible minimum price or maximum price of the equity. We know that it can go like almost anywhere to, to nothing. And we also have a, uh, a lot of example of the, uh, some equity shares goes up like crazy and uh, like and disappearing. We have uh, super uh, inflation and we have uh, we have different things in the market. So we so bounding uh, exchange rate is not always a good idea. Okay, so now we want to go even more crazy. And uh, as this picture suggests, uh, to solve some of the problems, we need time machine. Time machine is uh, uh, proven to be a very good tool. You can do a lot of things with time machine. So why? Uh, we will not try to use that. Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, seriously, what we're planning to do here is uh, not really so uh, controversial. We just try to generate our set of paths in a different way. So what we deal with is basically uh, always distribution of paths. Uh, we choose different filtration, but in principle, the way we choose filtration shouldn't necessarily uh, uh, be 100% uh, related to the way we generate our paths. We can generate them in any way and then choose filtration in any way too. So what uh, if we generate our paths starting from the like infinite future uh, the, the, towards the present? I can say, wow, it's weird. It's well, it has reality. Actually not if we use, uh, if, we, if we start using uh, conditional distribution, basically, uh, we just say, if we want to compute distribution from the actual 
uh, state z t like z at the time t zero. What we have to do, we can generate our distribution in any way we like from the future. Then we condition it and z t like the value of the current time, and that would be our spot distribution. That's all. So uh, we can apply this technique and we can compute kind of for a point forward process from reversing backward process. So now what we can do, we can apply the same process which we described to generate closed distribution, but we start from the few chain generated back to present. So why it's uh, help, how it's gonna help us? One thing is that now we can choose our time on infinite future, basically the time for which we start past generation. And by choosing this, uh, sorry, choosing the infinite state differently. And when choosing interest uh, in uh, this infinite state differently, we also call it vertices. We will actually introduce different measures. So if we apply, if we reverse the model, we actually have many different uh, measures. We basically choose asymptotic point for different assets. And now we have actually a natural set of different assets. There is no any more preferred preferred asset, preferred measure, we actually have many of them. And our model becomes symmetrical in the sense of choosing uh, choosing the number. Uh, the other advantage is that when we compute conditional distribution, now it depends not only on the circle at the time uh, T1, but also the circle at the time T, T0. So we have much more versatile set of distribution we can play with. And if uh, all the distribution in the reverse model in the closed form, the conditional distribution also in the closed form, uh, they actually, they, they, they written here, they still uh, have density, which is a kind of simple quadratic functions. Uh, you don't have to dwell on this formula. Uh, it's a standard, basically this is a standard formula for uh, conditional distributions. And the, the point is that, uh, it's, uh, this, uh, the model is remained very tractable and it's uh, very easy uh, to do computation in this model. So now as promised, we can choose different vertices and these different vertices would be associated with different assets. Uh, exchange rate uh, is uh, quite easy to compute. We have everything, uh, what we need. Uh, the only the only issue is that we still uh, we still uh, have uh, this old problem that we associate different vertices with different assets. But if asset is perpetual, it uh, its vertex should be within the area uh, outside the area omega infinity, which basically can be just one point. So it's it's effectively mean that. If the model is ten homogeneous, we have only one possible uh, perpetual asset, uh, self-financing asset. That's that's a kind of a limitation of this model. Uh, however, uh, the good news is uh, that sorry. Uh, The good news is that uh, the real self perpetual, uh, the real uh, self financing assets are not a trend in. And uh, so let's say if you have an asset which is, can be perpetual, for instance, a share, you can think about it as a combination of uh, dividends, it's a basket of dividends, and each dividend has a specific expiration date, it's not perpetual. So what we can do, we can associate each of this uh, perpetual um, transient asset with vertices, which doesn't have to be outside of the of the region uh, omega infinity. It's enough for it to uh, be outside the region, uh, which is the end of life of the of the perpetual of this transient asset. So we can solve this problem like that. How we do calibration in this model? Uh, the, it's it's uh, fairly easy to do calibration of this model because, uh, but you have to do it in non-traditional way. Normally, you start with 
short expiration, you calibrate to short term option, and then you can calibrate to longer term option, and then so on. Uh, we all know limitation about the bootstrapping. You can overfit the short term expiration, then it's hard to fit longer term expiration. Uh, uh, here, bootstrapping is an opposite way, right? So it, it's, it, it appears that in this model, you don't really uh, depend on the parameter associated with shorter time when you calibrate let's say European option, which expire uh, some longer term, longer time. So you can first disregard all the short term information, calibrate to longer term options. And then you bootstrap backward, adding new and new uh, shorter term option, like area associated with the shorter term, like the circle associated with shorter term and some other parameters uh, related to uh, a, a specific specific problem so you can do uh, you can do uh that's kind of bootstrapping backward uh it has its advantages it has its advantages you can uh it's uh, usually it's uh, easy to over calibrate short term but you can also over calibrate a longer term too but it's a normal issue which you have with bootstrapping but again it would be pretty unusual bootstrapping because instead of bootstrapping from short to long, we're bootstrapping from long to short. Uh, this presentation is dedicated to Carpels and actually it's related to one work uh, I did with Carpels some time ago, which called uh, Car uh, Carpels uh, distribution on Carpels wall surface. And the, the, the main idea behind the Carpels wall surface is actually also kind of a measure independent approach. So we say, oh, okay, we have two assets. We want to build wall surface. We have like one asset is a currency, another is a foreign currency or not, or equity or anything, right? So if we have two assets, we have two measures. And all we need to do is relate these two measures. And the idea was that we're going to relate these two measures by just a parallel shift of the argument. And here is actually very simple, right? We have distribution on a circle. A uh, circle can be mapped to a straight line. So it's uh, if we use uh, like half plane parameterization. So let's think about it uh, as a straight line. So we have two distribution related to two different vertices. And we know that uh, the area is uh, kind of uh, symmetric. It's transitive. So basically any point of the half plane can be moved by corporal transformation of the um, upper plane to, to another point. It's a fractional linear transformation with real coefficients. So we can do that. And it means, and this transformation would actually transform straight line into itself. And our distribution, uh, a link between distribution and the different measures would be related to that fractional linear transformation. In the case, in certain cases, when uh, two vertices had the same, um, imaginary part, it actually would be simple shift. So uh, basically we can say that the special case of a Karpov distribution, or you can also say that it's a kind of extension of Karpov distribution because uh, you allowed, uh, uh, in addition to parallel shift, you can use more generic fractional linear transformation, but the whole idea appears to be uh, pretty much in the same line as Karpov's. So we associate different measure by various transformation of variables. Now let's discuss application of this model. So far it was like still pretty abstract. Let's try to be more specific and let's show that we can actually use this model in real life. Uh, and here I list some of uh, application, some of them straightforward, some of them less straightforward. Um, uh, so the, here they are. Fact currency, stochastic dividends, stochastic interest rate, uh, forward variance, forward variance, it's like big pricing, what we mean here. And also uh, this model can be used, approximation of more complex model, which can, we can use like uh, uh, conformal diffusion, uh, unspun stochastic volatility model, which is a uh, version of the uh, market models, like interest rate, mar labor market model, but uh, advantages of a standard market model, they 
uh, have control number of state variables. Market model models tend to have like infinite number or a growing number of state variables. Uh, they so called fast dependent, and uh, this and spunk means we can avoid this type of path dependency. Uh, so uh, this model is still pretty complex and uh, that conformal term diffusion, which we suggest here, can use as a simplified, can be considered in some cases as a simplified version of these models. So let's start with spec currency. Spec currency is the most straightforward uh, straightforward example because whatever is shortcoming of this approach is actually advantage for the packed currency so the fact is that exchange rate is bounded is great for packed currency because packed currency exactly means that they pack it means you can you restrict the how much exchange rate can be changed right so that's actually a good thing and also uh the violation of Time, the inability of have time homogeneous model is not a problem either because by nature pegging is always transient. So we don't expect packed currency market to be really uh, eternal and time stationary. It's we 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 know that it's only it's um, it's only going to exist for so long. Uh, the second uh, approach, uh, the second example of usage can be stochastic dividends model. So we, we we kind of understand that we cannot use a model straightforward in a straightforward to describe equity for two reasons. First of all, equity is not really uh, value preserving. Equity does pay dividends. And also uh, we have kind of a, a limitation in how we can describe Perpetual, perpetual uh, martingales. So, taking this both incompatibility together, we actually create kind of incompatibility because we say, what is it? What is it? In fact, shares. It's not self financing, but it's a portfolio of uh, assets which self financing before certain horizon. Mainly, it's dividends with each space, and so we just kind of create a set of assets, each of them separate dividend, and they can all have different exchange rate between each other. That's why it's a kind of stochastic dividend model. And now what we should do, we should uh, we create this circle area associated with any uh, moment when dividend is paid. For simplicity, we say that X dividend and dividend payment day is the same. We can, uh, we don't really need this constraint, but it's easier to think about the problem in this way. And then what we need is for every dividend date, we have to have a vertex associated with dividends which live outside uh, the region, uh, the circle um, associated with a dividend payment type. And as long as we do that, uh, we have our model loop defined because we define every uh, we define um, like every dividend, which every asset in our model, and when we evaluate the value of the uh, equity, we just evaluate it as a sum of value of the dividends. Uh, the way it looks like uh, we have to kind of have a circle associated with every dividend time. Actually, when we calibrate the model, we have to calibrate the circle associated with every time. And then we uh, like place the vertex associated with the dividends somewhere outside uh, this circle uh, associated with the time when dividend is paid. And as uh, was said before, when we calibrate it, we, when we calibrate the model, we start calibration from the longest expiration, we calibrate European option of the longest expiration, and then we have to kind of extrapolate it. So we have to assume like what would be series, infinite series of dividends paid. After that expiration, we can use like uh, time from ingenuity, conformal symmetry for that, uh, like, and, uh, and uh, we, for the assumption about how uh, the circles um, would extrapolate after the last day, uh, there are many ways to do that. So after we make this assumption, we calibrate the, the first expiration based on whatever parameters we have. And uh, then we can just start bootstrapping back, adding vertices for dividends and uh, position of the uh, next option expirations, which we know, 
uh, until we get to the short-term expiration. So we can fully calibrate this expiration, uh, I mean, this model. Uh, unfortunately, uh, of course, I expect criticism of this model because we only use one uh, state variable to describe basically in stochastic volatility and, and stochastic dividends. So it's not probably not enough in, in real life, uh, but uh, the model can be easily extended and make multidimensional. Yeah, I, I already went through that slide practically because I already can get give some idea about how uh, how the model could be uh, should be calibrated and uh, how it should be parameterized. So about stochastic rates. With stochastic rates, what we do is pretty much the same as with stochastic dividends, but now uh, we interpret, uh, now instead of modeling uh, dividend payment, we model zero coupon bonds. Uh, and option on, we have to calibrate to swap options. Swap options, it can be linked to options on bond and bonds are actually also kind of the same as it can be a portfolio of zero coupon bonds. So the problem remain actually pretty much almost the same as for stochastic dividends. The only difference is that when we price uh, European option uh, on equity, it's assumed that we have the whole series of dividends paid uh, towards infinity when you price option and bond, uh, you actually have a finite set uh, of uh, zero coupon bonds of coupons, which basically uh, paid uh, between uh, starting of the swap and end day of the swap. But it's only kind of simplify the problem. In the same time, we have more calibration point because you have different tenors in equity case, we only have options on equity, which is some of, uh, which is basically infinite tenor for in interest rate, we can have many tenors. So we can have more conditions uh, simultaneous, which would be hard to calibrate. And it would emphasize that we actually need more dimensions because having one dimension and uh, probably would be insufficient to calibrate uh, even for the given expiration to calibrate swap option with all uh, different tenors. Uh, again, now let's uh, uh, discuss a few ex extension of this model in the conclusion, uh, what we can do, uh, how we can go move forward. Uh, the technique which I suggest uh, now, I think is promising, but uh, we need to be able to expand it to, uh, to address like real world, uh, it's still uh, too constraining. One of the, main extension, which fortunately very clear uh, how to do, is instead of using two-dimensional conformal symmetry, we can develop almost very similar technique, but use high-dimensional conformal symmetries. And uh, high-dimensional conformal, uh, high conformal symmetry actually make one life things better uh, than two-dimensional, because uh, you don't need to introduce time reverse or, uh, reversal to introduce, uh, to have different measures uh, in the in high dimensional conformal symmetry. In high dimensional conformal symmetry, you never have preferred numeral. So you kind of naturally have different numeral. Moreover, there is a certain kind of duality between the reverse model and, uh, and forward model, uh, which you don't see um, you, you don't see in two dimensions. So it's a kind of even, uh, you have like pretty mathematics in a way, and you have much more flexibility with high dimensional conformal symmetries. That uh, if you apply this high dimensional conformal symmetry to interest rate model, it actually would be like special case of the model which we considered before, can be surface approximation which to the model we considered before, which called adaptive curve evolution model. Uh, this adaptive curve evolution model has is much more flexible, but it doesn't have closed form distribution and it doesn't allow, allow this backward bootstrapping calibration. So uh, Basically, with adaptive curve evolution model, with this model, it can be approximation, but in this approximation, we can do a lot of things much faster and much in, in much more close form and probably would be able to use much faster, a better price for 
for instance, uh, Vermilion's workshops. Another extension, which is a, a, a little more crazy to say, so far we use a complex, complex, very complex plane, which is a trivial topology complex surface. We can, uh, conformal uh, surface, we can use uh, non-trivial topology like torus or like Eddie more handles, what it gives you. Uh, if you have non-trivial topology, then basically uh, your, your circle wouldn't consist of one, it wouldn't be a circle, it would be different disconnected areas and it dis disconnected uh, circles. And in, in this case, you can interpret them as some kind of a discrete state, which you jumping in between and having some tradition uh, between events. And you can also uh, set a special time uh, first moment when uh, you move from one state to two states, which you can associate some rights in the market. I'll show you in the in the next picture. And uh, what else you can do, and it's most complex thing, probably, and we're not sure it would be possible to do to do it without losing closed form, is jumping from the uh, projective geometry, which we in fact use in two-dimensional complex number, to uh, uh, to other divisional algebra like quaternion or octonion. And why we need to do that, uh, it's um, there's advantages of using uh, conformal models based on division algebra because they can be kind of paired together. What I mean is, let's say you have a model of one asset which you calibrate and a model of some other like asset. Or, like you, Let's say you have two interest rate models for one currency, another currency. And now you want to combine them to have like some hybrid model, uh, which model effects rate and also model stochastic rate on both currency. Uh, if they're just two conformal models, there is no natural way how you can pair them without uh, even, uh, without keeping like close form or semi close form with most of the thing. Uh, when you use division algebra, there is a more extended way to pair the model. So that's what nice about uh, division algebra. And we use the division algebra before with a diffusive conformal model. So I kind of wonder if we can do that with a conformal jump diffusion. Maybe we can, maybe we, no, we cannot. We may certainly lose some uh, solvability when we try that, but it's something to consider. So in the conclusion, I just want to demonstrate how we expect this, uh, we can apply non-trivial topology. We can say that you see this point where uh, the kind of you, uh, uh, you conformal manifold split into two, you can say that there are some events what happened on this day and after this event, you can be in two states and you can kind of transit from one state uh, to another state from that moment. Uh, so uh, I'm not quite sure about uh, application of that, but the good news, if we need to do something like this, we'll still have a uh, close form. So in that picture, I would like to conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for attention, for your interest. And uh, let's meet again at some point. That was wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much, Gregory. It, it reminds me of the Archimedes quote, give me a fulcrum and a lever and I shall... Uh, move the world, but with this presentation, oh. it's uh, you know, give me a fulcrum and a lever, and I shall move two worlds. And I completely agree with uh, the theory of your presentation today. Um, our, our market does lie in many, many, many different states, and often those states are completely uh, uncorrelated with each other, which is the greatest hurdle towards supplying technology to the financial markets. Uh, you know, you can't build an Apple product for the financial markets because they are ever changing. Um, you know, this was fantastic, fantastic today. I, I couldn't be more. Yes. Yeah. So, sorry, my my uh, my intro just went off, and I was uh, part of your speech. This is this is one of the best lectures I've uh, sat in on on a very long time. I I couldn't be more thankful to you. Uh, you really uh, gave such a phenomenal talk today. Uh, thank you so much, Gregory, and uh, I. So appreciative. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it, interestingly enough, I use this uh, point about give me, uh, give me the, uh, give me oh, the right. basic point and I can turn the world. 
I, I have a, like some time ago, I had a presentation uh, related. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, basically, it was, it was like basically give me. I, I, I think, I think, I think, I, I think I sat in on that presentation too, and I think you did use that for uh, another maybe yeah. quantum mechanics uh, lecture. Um, yeah. I would highly recommend everybody follow Gregory Peltz on LinkedIn. Um, check out his work on SSRN or whatnot. Um, you know, uh, absolutely just a beautiful and unique mind, Gregory. Uh, thank you so much for donating your time to the MITA and Quant uh, Online Conference. And I'm excited to see you uh, this week. Okay, uh, great. See you, see you uh, this week. And uh, thank you for your kindness. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you so much.